so it's being recorded now. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here in this online event in conversation with Dawn Edge about embracing equity. Dawn is a professor of mental health and inclusivity at the University of Manchester. Uh, she is also academic lead for equality, diversity and inclusion on race, religion and belief. She is the University of Manchester's first black woman professor. And Dawn is also a member of the Board of Governors at the Health Foundation and Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Research Unit within the Greater Manchester Mental Health NHS Trust. She has previously served as a non-executive -execu director of NHS Mental Health Trust and on the board of trustees of community organizations that work with marginalized communities. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dawn, for joining us and for agreeing to talk to us. It's absolutely wonderful. Oh, um, thank you, Karen. We're hoping to have this event uh, as a very interactive event. So please, everyone, if you have a question, um, just unmute yourself, ask a question or put a question in the chat. I'm going to stop sharing this first slide now so I can see everyone and monitor who is being active and who wants to ask a question. Now, Dawn, so first question. Um, you are an incredibly inspirational woman. And I was wondering yeah. what actually inspires you, what drives you? Oh my gosh, um, so I guess, so I'm one of those people. Oh, don't, who, we can, I cannot hear you. Can you not? Oh, but my microphone is on. Is it on? Yes, now it's better. It's better? Oh, okay. So this is the connectivity. I'm on campus today and my connectivity here is way worse than when I'm at home. So um, hopefully it won't drop again yet. So, um, so I should say that a couple of things. I'm the daughter of one of those people who are sometimes referred to in the in news as um, a member of the Windrush generation. So that group of people who um, answered the clarion call and recruitment drives in the Caribbean in um, South Asia and so on to come to the UK to help rebuild the mother country, as it was then called, because these parts of the Commonwealth, uh, many of them not independent nations post-war. And people really believed that they were British citizens with equal rights to all British citizens. So, um, you know, when, they, when the Commonwealth Act was passed, people like my parents came to do their bit. Um, and I, I'm, so I'm inspired by people like them because they came, not like we are today, you know, when you can just Google everything. But, mm. you know, they left not really having a clue what life was going to be like for some of them. Those who've been here as servicemen and women did. But a lot of people didn't. And if you look at pictures of people coming off the, um, the um, SS Empire Windrush, you see them in these beautiful floral skirts and, and their gloves and their beautiful hats. They had no idea <laughs> they were going from 30, 30 plus degrees to zero or, or, or less. So they came completely unprepared physically. But more importantly, most of them became unprepared emotionally or spiritually for the reception they were going to get. They genuinely thought they were going to come and be embraced. And of course, what they met instead were the no dogs, no blacks, no Irish signs. Um, and people like my mum working alongside somebody who um, coincidentally became really good friends with. But my mum literally got paid half of what her white friend was paid. And those are the, that's what they endured. And they did that because they wanted better prospects for their children. So I'm, I'm the product of that. You know, I'm the return on my parents' investment of their, literally their blood, sweat and tears into this country. So they're, they're what inspired me. Plus, always having had a you know, um, from being a child, I think a lot of us have it, don't, they? Uh, don't we? Um, the sense of wanting things to be fair. You know, you hear three-year-olds saying, it's, but it's not fair. It, that's never quite left me, that sense that I want to put things right that don't seem to be fair. Absolutely. So um, you are an incredibly successful researcher doing uh, loads of research on uh, inequalities, in particular inequalities in uh, underrepresented, underprivileged groups. Um, so I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit more about your research and the most surprising findings from your research. 
Um, so, yeah, so the, the reasons I say that I do the work that I do is because it's linked to my own values about wanting things to be fair. So very much from a social justice perspective. Um, so the research that I'm doing now expands a few, few different areas, but I started my with my PhD. I looked at depression during and after pregnancy and specifically why I didn't know about any black women who talked about having postnatal depression and where were they and you know what kind of support and care were they receiving. Turns out not so much. Um, and then, you know, I've done work with people, uh, the mental health people in prisons, looking at women um, who, have, who have, are having babies while they're in prisons or having small children while they're in prisons, and the unintended consequences of incarcerating women, often for relatively trivial offences, not only on them, but on their children, and how, you know, that the net, the, the, it, what then happens is essentially we end up feeding the beast because those children end up often going into the care system and, you know, there's higher risk of those children then ending up in the criminal justice system themselves. And it just felt, you know, so that's that's one area. Um, um, I guess right at the heart of what I do, though, is a lot of it's around engaging communities before co-production and or PPA and all that stuff became a thing. I was talking to people in churches and in barbershops and hairdressers and stuff around what we could do differently about the, uh, to improve uh, their health, physical and mental health. Um, so really talking to people about from a very much from an assets based approach. So, you know, you talked about you know these underprivileged groups, but actually, you know, I talked about my parents and people like them coming and they had to be incredibly resourceful in order to survive. And so within these communities, there are lots of resources that are obviously that are often not regarded as that. And what we focus on is from quite a paternalistic perspective, that kind of, you know, we need to help these underprivileged people rather than looking at what they have and actually how some of the things that they have might be able to help us. You know, somebody once said to me, given what people like my parents had to endure in this country, it's a wonder more of them weren't mad. So mm. given that they weren't, what were the things that they were using to draw on? What were the things that they used to help to foster their and, and, and to promote and to keep their mental health and well-being? Um, and some of those things, things like faith, some of those things are like um, connectivity to each other. Um, you know, sometimes it's quite negative when people talk about how um, migrant communities stick together. Well, there's a reason for that. There isn't because it buffers people against the everyday racism that they face outside. So, um, yeah, and, 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 and from having those kind of conversations at the moment, there's two main pieces of work that I'm doing. One is to work collaboratively with um, service users, their families, community members, health professionals, a range of other people to, um, to develop uh, culturally appropriate talking therapies for uh, black families affected by psychosis and schizophrenia, where we have the highest risk of being diagnosed in the UK, uh, but no culturally informed interventions. Um, and doing some work with, um, with the Mental Health Trust and faith communities about how faith communities may, be, uh, uh, may provide a, a bit of a community hub to have conversations and to provide support around dementia, uh, which is really was often poorly understood across all groups. But, you know, there's some often uh, some particular issues around beliefs linked to faith that we may be able to break down by having that collaboration between um, services and faith communities. That's so incredibly interesting. I, I, I always um, I'm always interested in how different researchers and how different people approach this uh, this idea of helping other communities because we all, of course all have our idea of what the community might want right but in the end I think what you just said is super important that we actually listen and we ask them right nothing mm -hmm. about us without us mm -hmm. and so I think it's so important um, are there any major uh, highlights or findings that you would like uh, to emphasize and something that was really surprising that you found in your research that you were sort of not expecting and 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 you, you sort of yeah sort of yeah almost something that really struck struck you and you thought wow what is yeah. that? Well, yeah. maybe, maybe I start not so, much, not so much with, you know, kind of formal research findings, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, but, um, you know, as, as, as recently as during the pandemic, so I mentioned this culturally ad adapted uh, family therapy that we're developing, um, and we were due to start the randomized control trial 
on the 1st of April 2020. So, of course, then we had to defer and defer and defer. And when it became clear that it wasn't just going to be a couple of months, I approached the funders to ask if we, you know, to suggest that we might have some additional funding to develop an online um, offer. So we'd be able to deliver the therapy remotely. And I cannot tell you how many letters I had to write, how many meetings I had to have, how many times I had to keep going back to explain why black people might, it might not be a good idea for them to be in a room to have therapy with strangers. And this was in the height of the pandemic where every night we were seeing showing on our screens walls of people, black and brown people being disproportionately impacted by, um, by, by COVID, not just in communities, but actually, if you remember some of those in, initial shots um, were of the, um, the workforce, because nearly all of the, the first wave of doctors who died were, were black and brown people. And we were still, they were still seeing that. And yet the conversation around tackling inequalities were, yeah, well, but do you really need that? And I think that's, that's one of the things that, uh, that you asked me about what drives me. It still, I find really puzzling is that when I, you know, when I go for when I write grants and, and so on, a bit better now, that, that, that I'm a bit better now, but certainly in the early days, people were going, but, you know, can't we just do this with mainstream services? What, what, why, why do we need to change things? And you go, well, we've been trying that for 70 years. It hasn't really worked, has it? And not just for people of colour. You know, if you remember the whole ethos of setting up the NHS, the welfare state, was to tackle inequalities. There was a time when white, British, Scottish, Irish, English people had to make a choice between feeding their families and buying medicines. That's, that's one of the, that's the main driver for setting up the NHS is that it should be free to everybody with equal access, access free at the point of delivery. And it should not be um, dependent on your ability to pay, you know, with maybe a conversation for another day. That looks yeah, like we lose, we've lost quite a lot of that now, doesn't it? But it's it, it, that dissonance between what people say and what they do. So there's a lot at the moment around policies and nearly every major organisation has got an EDI, an equality, diversity, inclusion strategy. They've got some kind of plan. And yet when you actually try to implement that by saying, by pointing out inequalities and inequities, you kind of get a pushback, you know, in the same way that you, that often people deny that structural inequalities exist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it sounds like you are a really passionate and strong woman who just plows <laughs> through and goes forward. Um, so, about that. And as I mentioned earlier, in 2019, you became the first uh, black professor at the University of Manchester. Yeah. And I suppose you must have had some challenges and experienced some tough times as well. So I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit more about your experiences of actually getting there to the very top. Yeah. So it's, I think it would be fair to say it was um, a circuitous journey, one with many twists and turns and a bit of a challenge, a few challenges along the way. And um, and really, you know, most of you probably know that, that the first um, black professor in the whole of the UK was uh, Professor Sir Arthur Lewis, who was a Manchester, professor at Manchester. So Manchester had the first ever black professor and he was um his inauguration was in 1948 he then went on to win the nobel prize i've got you know it's a bit of a tough act to follow right but <laughs> nevertheless um so it, there was quite a long time wasn't there between you know a black man achieving that and a woman and and that obviously points to some of the stuff that we know around intersectionality intersectional identities and how they can amplify inequalities so in terms of my own journey um I don't know that it's that dissimilar to lots of colleagues, uh, white women that I speak to about some of the challenges, particularly around kind of hidden, kind of hidden, hidden criteria when you don't quite know, you don't quite understand how the system works, taking a long time to understand the rules of engagement. So, you know, there's a stuff that's written down and then there's a stuff that 
somebody has to tell you about because it's not written down anywhere. Um, so I found that quite quite difficult, especially being somebody who's fairly used to being, you know, reasonably straight talking. Um, so that kind of having to go behind and go round and networking for me it was you know, I'm getting better at it. I like meeting people, I love people, but that kind of networking, which is a kind of meeting people with intent to progress, to, you know, to progress your own agenda, I find really challenging. It's not in my nature. Um, so all of those things are kind of against you, you know, if you're, if you're from certain cultural backgrounds where it's, we are very much more from, from a we type mentality rather than an I, mm. um, if you're, uh, you know, if, you, if you're gendered and so, and so far that those behaviors that in a man would be applauded for being evidence of strong leadership, but in a woman is seen as being aggressive, um, then all of those kind of subtle things play out in ways that are sometimes difficult to articulate, frankly. Mm. Um, and I, I certainly found, so I was, you know, very fortunate to, um, to be awarded um, what was then called a Stepping Stones Fellowship mm. many years ago, and I think 2006. And the idea of those fellowships was acknowledging that early, early career researchers often needed some support to make, to transition from, um, you know, their PhDs and early postdoc work to becoming independent researchers. And I remember getting one of these and a very senior person in my then department, not one of me now, let me just say that, um, said, um, oh, you're very ambitious, aren't you? <laughs> and I remember going home and I was journaling and writing and I wrote, why does it sound like a dirty word? When this, why would you give me a job? Why would you have me in your department if I wasn't ambitious? Isn't that the whole point? Um, and then somebody else within the same, uh, even more senior, said exactly the same thing. When so I went in with what I what I thought was going to be a well done, congratulations, mm -hmm. we're so delighted that you've brought this. And what I got was, mm -hmm. well, you're very ambitious, but not in a way. So you know, kind of let's amplify that. How can we support you? It was very much kind of. Oh. Um, anyway, not surprisingly, um, I I didn't exactly thrive in that in that environment, partly because I said I didn't really understand the rules of engagement. And I did actually, and this is really important for those of you who may be in the same space at the moment, I know there's like a, what's it called, a resigna resignation pandemic, or what it's called. Um, but I actually got to the point where I seriously considered leaving academia. And I... Um, I actually, well, I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I actually um, registered my company with Companies House. I gave mm -hmm. it a name and I was going to go off and do consultancy because uh, you mentioned in the introduction I was already um, a non-exec. I had a clinical background. I thought, you know, I could make a shed load of money, far more than I can as an academic, doing stuff that might actually make a difference rather than um, rather than do this. But just before I did that, I... Um, I, I sent, I shared my CV with four people, uh, four very senior people, and just asked them to have a look and to tell me what they thought, whether they thought I had, if you like, the right stuff, whether I, whether I was capable of doing it. And interestingly, one person said to me, you need to leave. <laughs> you need to go somewhere else where you'll be appreciated. But generally speaking, it was, you know, it was positive, positive, uh, positive noises. And actually, I've got, I've got there's somebody on here that I want to just acknowledge. And I don't mean to embarrass you, Sarah, but Sarah Cottrell um, mm -hmm. was one of the people who was really um, responsible for helping to to change my fortunes. So I worked with Sarah as part of the research design service. I can't tell you how much I love RDS. Um, and, and that, at the point at which I'd got quite, I was quite low in confidence, I was essentially, you know, receiving those letters that say, you're coming to the end of your contract, we're going to have to let you go if you don't get something else soon. And RDS essentially res rescued me. And I worked with wonderful colleagues um, like, like Sarah, um, who spotted the job in it was before we were reconfigured in the department that I'm in now and and, and highlighted that to me and, and I was like no 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 it's not for me not for me not for me and then you know the job I didn't apply the first time round and it, and then um I just thought no I'm gonna just gonna go and then it came round again and, and she said you know what's the worst can happen you know you go for the job you hate it you do it for I was you know a few months whilst you're sorting out your consultancy and then you move um but I'm still here. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so I'm really was... glad I've got the opportunity to say <laughs> publicly to Sarah, thank you on International Women's Day that you're one of the people who absolutely oh. rescued my career. So thank you. Wonderful. That's absolutely fantastic. I have no idea that happened. So. No, and obviously and that's really important because obviously 
sometimes you don't. You, you re we really don't know the impact that we have on people. Um, and I think, you know, we, we are encouraged, I think, you know, although we talk team science, we are encouraged to be individual and um, competitive. And we don't always know, you know, the kindness of strangers. And small, you know, what might seem quite quite small acts of kindness, um, and you know how that that can absolutely turn around somebody's career, and not just mine, because you know, I now have teams that employ other people, and you know, gone on to supervise PhDs. So it's really made not just an impact on mine, so that ripple effect. So just continue being kind. I'm just going to encourage you. If you take nothing away from today, just be kind and and, and share, because it, it it yeah, you'll never know whose life you might change. I was going to ask you what's uh, changed, made you change your mind and not actually leave academia, but I think I know now. <laughs> but what I'm going to ask instead is, uh, what was the best advice that you received uh, in your academic career so far um, in terms of progression and sort of moving on and really not leaving academia? Um, I think somebody once said to me, um, another woman, <laughs> when I was in this doldrum, you know, this place of thinking, oh, it's just terrible, terrible. She said, you know, I must have been having one of these conversations. And she just said, why don't you focus on what you are and not what you're not? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, you know, look at the range of skills that you have. And as I say, when I was doing the work in communities, I didn't even mention it on my CV because then it wasn't a thing. You know, all that stuff around seed service and leadership and community engagement and knowledge transfer, it wasn't seen as it being, being particularly valuable or valid. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to, to being able to bring those two bits of me together, as it were, and kind of integrate them, the stuff that I was doing that I'm really passionate about and not seeing it as something that I did outside, but actually bring that to the forefront of being what dri drives my, my research and, you know, the way I work with people and, um, that was that was absolutely transformative that's amazing so important indeed right to focus on the positive and not sort of like oh what is missing what else is missing from my cv what am i missing here well because um, often i think you know well i can't say for other people but for me i think what is missing from my cv became what is missing from me mm -hmm. So it's much more about, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, looking something, not good enough here. So the point I was making, the, the thing I said before, and I know it takes courage. I don't think I realised quite how courageous it was at the time. Maybe it was desperation to actually ask people um, to have a look at your CV and tell you what they really think and whether they think you have the right stuff. I'm not saying, I'm not recommending you all do that, but there are other ways of doing that, you know, with people who you trust and, you know, getting their support, getting their advice um, is really helpful. So I can see Sandra's on here. So she's another person. So Sandra for a little while was my line manager. Um, and I had some wonderful IPDRs, you know, where some, you know, she was very supportive about things that I wanted to achieve. And, you know, and, and also, you know, um, in a way that you're doing, Carolina, kind of highlight lighting going but didn't you do this thing didn't you do that <laughs> didn't you? and what about this thing why is that not on your cv you know and really helping me to see the value behind some of the things that are probably underplayed a little bit mm, fantastic um so now looking back at mm. uh, uh, your younger self when you were in the uh, career researcher mm. um is there any bit of advice that you would have, you would give yourself uh, anything that you think, oh, I wish I had someone actually tell me that? Mm, I think really early on, that's the thing about learning the rules of engagement. Mm. So I didn't even know, for example, for those that don't know where people are at the stage of their journey, I didn't really know what their promotions criteria looked like. Mm. Didn't know, didn't, didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you're if you're if you are ambitious, as I was labelled, as you know, how can you, you know, target your career in a way that's meaningful towards achieving success in terms of promotion, if that if that's if that matters to you, when you don't know what the, what the what the the the, um, the criteria are, it's a bit like you know getting in your car to drive to from here to Birmingham, but you've no idea which direction you're going in. And you don't know which roads to take. You've got no sat nav. You've got no book of maps. And you've got no one sitting in the passenger seat to give you direction. You're just going and hoping that somehow you're going to get there. Well, it doesn't work like that, does it? So I do think um, finding finding 
good people, surrounding yourself with good people. Sometimes it's by luck. Um, but I th but I do think that some people are much better at doing it by design. You know, looking at people who whose work and not just their work, but people who you like as people, who you admire as people and finding out how how they've done it and still kept the essence of their humanity. Mm. <laughs> there are some people who've achieved amazing things, but I wouldn't want to be like them. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no matter how much, no matter what I was going mm -hmm. to achieve, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want it to be at the cost of becoming the way I see them treat people mm -hmm. and, and to behave. So I, I'm, I would say, look, look for people. And I think not, not people. Who, well, obviously, if I'm going to look for somebody that looked like me, I would have a long wait, right? So it's looking for other people with different qualities. Um, sometimes people who are very different from yourself. I had a, a one of my again, you know, think about the things that kept kept me here. A very positive encounter with somebody who was then the dean of the medical school, white, middle-aged man, and he gave me incredibly sound advice, which I still draw on today. I had a um, white man who was a mentor, joined the Manchester Gold Mentoring Scheme, um, and I had a white man who was, again, very generous. You know, he met me and he just said, mm, I'm not sure I'm the best person for you, because at that point I was thinking about going into um, an HS leadership. And um, and he said, but I know somebody who does. I know somebody in London. And I think he'd be really good. And I went and met this guy. And he was, again, the lessons I learned from him, I share with everybody, PhD students, friends, colleagues, people in the community, because they, again, were absolutely transformational. So you know, there's, there's help and support around. But I do think, you know, at that point when I was in the doldrums, had I chosen the wrong four people, maybe I would have gone. Had I not had a Sarah in my corner to just say, well, why don't you just, do you know what I mean? So I think there are times when, you, you know, you, you just need to be bold and to be brave and to courageous and to be, and, and part of that is actually acknowledging a vulnerability, acknowledging that things aren't going well and asking for help. And I think sometimes we are encouraged to, that that's, you know, we're discouraged from doing that because it's seen as a sign of weakness, particularly if you're a woman. They're asking for help or just saying, I don't know how to do this. It's not seen as a good thing. Um, exactly. That's so difficult, isn't yeah. it? Um, I was wondering, uh, so you mentioned several times uh, the term ambitious and uh, <laughs> that it became sort of the negative term, right? Um, so how, how did you deal with it and how did you overcome it? How did you turn it into something positive? Because my impression now is that in the end, it became the positive experience and being ambitious was something positive. But the yeah. first uh, uh, first encounter with the term. Was, I, know, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, that, I, that I have. I think maybe it's probably mm -hmm. some of the, at the back of my mind. It's probably still there. I think because I didn't, I didn't really regard myself as being particularly ambitious. I, what drove me was seeing that there were things that seemed inherently unfair, unjust, and thinking, well, what, why, why is nobody doing anything about this? <laughs> and then thinking, oh, okay, well, if nobody else is, then maybe I'll give it a go. At least I'll try, you know, if it doesn't work, at least I'll give it a go. Um, so I, I would, and then aligning that, so I'm a, I'm a woman of faith, I'm a Christian, and, I, and very much a lot of my values are aligned to that. And so for me, you know, that think about being fair, being just, um, providing service, um, and that those things kind of then coalesce around the kind of work that I want to do. And again, in early careers, you know, I was advised against doing qualitative research because it's not real research. And um, who wants to listen to stories about, in my case, sad black women? You know, that's, that's not going to get funding. You need to be doing stuff with huge data sets and da 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 da. So there is something about remain, find, you know, holding on to that kernel of the truth of who you are and what makes you tick and what really matters to you and just not losing that. And sometimes when, you know, when the flame gets a little bit low, you kind of have to come alongside people who are just going to, to, to boost you a little bit. So surround yourself with good people and if you're you know we're, and we're not all fortunate to have that at home some people do they have you know really great families but sometimes family is not a place where people are particularly supportive you may be the first in family you may have you know challenging personal relationships caring for other people there may be a whole load of things that mean that actually sometimes coming to work is a bit of a sanctuary so to come there and to be surrounded by people who are competitive and not particularly kind is just really it's really hard so yeah just reiterating where 
mm. a kindness message because you don't know what people bring to work. You know, we come and we put on the makeup, some of us, we put on the makeup <laughs> and uh, we put on the suits or the lab coats or the whatever we come on and, and we look the part, but you don't know. You don't know whose marriage is in trouble, whose kid is sick, whose parent has just been diagnosed with dementia. You don't, you, you know, who's got breast cancer or uh, prostate cancer. You've no idea what people are living with. And just because we come to work and present that way, you know, I know when I've had real personal struggles and, and work has been my sanctuary and I haven't told people because actually I wanted to leave that um, at home. But, you know, there are people who would just invite for a cup of coffee. You don't have to tell them stuff, but just the kindness, um, I think, has been, been part of my salvation. Yeah, I, I love this advice. I mean, kindness and a kind network, uh, really network of good people, right? And, yeah. Um, good mentors. I, I found it also very interesting when you mentioned that uh, having the right kind of people who lift you and who sort of guides you through the, through the process is very important. And I, I, mm-hmm. agree with it. I think it's uh, absolutely amazing to have the right people around you. But also, um, it's really difficult to know how to choose, right? And how do you know yes. who's the right person to, <laughs> to approach and to include in your network? Yeah, 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 yeah. And well, and I think, you know, so mentorship now is, is quite a thing. But not everybody knows how to be a mentor. So I, mm. I, I mentioned the stepping stones and I had a fantastic person who was my mentor. And if I had him now, oh, my God, if I knew then what I know now, I would have been streets ahead. But I didn't. And he didn't. So neither of us knew how to do the mentoring thing. So we met and we had really nice chats. But we didn't. It wasn't, it wasn't mentoring. Um, and, and so I, I think do your homework you know there's like vita they've got a framework around um academic support there's some there's some good stuff out there now that you can read and you can prepare yourself and you can think about what you want out of a mentoring relationship and there's also the peer mentoring you know that there's stuff that you can do coming alongside other people or at a similar point so maybe there's not quite the same level of competition and of course you've got to pay it forward to the people who are coming behind you um the other thing i've mentioned i've not mentioned though is is coaching so one of the lessons that um, this guy meant to tell you from Manchester Gold um, told me was about that, you know, he had a coach and he invested, he paid good money to have a coach. And I was like, what, 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 that is a, that, what? <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. But the reality is, you know, especially as you go further and further up in your career, you would be competing for roles with people who do have coaches and who do have mentors. And who do have sponsors, that's another term that we don't, often don't use, sometimes we call them advocates, but people who are talking about you when you're not in the room, people who are opening doors for you when you don't even know that they're doing it. And that's how, you know, people who succeed, um, we don't just succeed because we're good at what we do. Everybody on here is great at what we do. We wouldn't be here if we weren't. Um, but what's going to enable some people to climb further is either that they step on loads of people and, and are not very nice people, or and they have people around them who they go to for advice and they go to for support. And sometimes, you know, that's paid. Sometimes it's not paid. But I just, you know, if, if that's something, you know, if you feel a little bit stuck in your career and you feel that you've got imposter syndrome and stuff that's going on, anything that's good, I would just say pay the money. Pay the money and go and get some counselling or pay a coach. Do what you need to do to get out of your own way. That was one of the things that I had to do, I had to get out of my own way. Um, you know, I'm never going to be loud and flamboyant. It's not my nature. And I do quite like leading from behind, but there are some times when you have to step forward. And, and certainly in this role, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard to, to do it from behind, but that's my natural thing is to just be with people, be collegiate. Um, and, you know, I'm not like, striding out in front saying, come on, follow me this way over the mountain. I'm much more, okay, so how are we going to do this? But there are times when, when you need something else. So yeah. That's um, absolutely fantastic. Well, uh, clearly your way of, of uh, dealing with it paid uh, off and you know, here you are <laughs> doing incredibly well, um, being the uh, professor at the moment. But you know, Caroline, it's going to just say, you say, here you are. And I think the other thing, you know, I told you about those rules of engagement and not really understanding. So I got my chair and I didn't realize that there are all these other steps now. <laughs> right. It was a whole other process of, of um, you know, of promotions throughout through the professorial ladder. I'm like, damn, I'm, like, I'm at the bottom of another mountain. I've just climbed and I thought I was at the top of Everest. Turns out I've just reached base camp and now I've got to go. 
<laughs> Keep on climbing. <laughs> Still climbing. Um, but, but I'm saying that to, to, to say, really, it's also really important for us as individuals to decide what we want to do, what matters most. And I do think one of the positives from the pandemic and people having a pause and working differently is I know so many people are going, no, no, actually, no, I was going to go for chair. No, I'm quite happy remaining a senior lecturer because I want the work-life balance. And I realised that there are other things that are far more precious than, than um, you know, than ambition. And, you know, and ambition comes in different ways. So, you know, maybe that I'm not going to climb this way, but actually I'm going to be more impactful this way. I'm going to be doing things in my community and globally, but at the level that I'm at and working, you know, being there for my family is, is far more important than that going to the next step. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you said now <laughs> there are yet <laughs> more steps to go through. Um, so I was wondering, what are your hopes for the future, your personal future and the future of the world, maybe future of the university? I mean, now and we know that uh, Nancy Rothwell is uh, going to leave um, uh, her post uh, next year. That's so so, like, well, yeah. I have to say, I'm, I don't want to be, I have no aspirations to being Nancy. Take note from answer so you can rest assured of that. But um, wouldn't it be wonderful to think that the place where the first ever black professor in the UK, um, you know, was inaugurated might be the first place to have a black professor as, as the VC of a Russell Group in, in, institution. I mean, we've got lots of other people who've got very senior roles and provosts mm -hmm. and stuff, but, you know, kind of a research intensive institution. And here, it would be wonderful, wouldn't it, to think that that might happen in, in, in my lifetime, if not in my, in my academic career. Um, and and uh, one of the things, so some of you will have heard about the 100 black women professors now. So you'll know that black professors are less than, still less than 1% of the professoriate. Um, so, and there are, depending on how you count, but last I heard of 41 black women professors, I think I was number 32, rumor has it, I'm not, not entirely sure. Um, so this is the Women in Higher Education Network Initiative, and I'm pleased to say that Manchester has signed up as, to, be, um, to be one of the sites to look at what we can do to support, to amplify, to remove barriers, to enable people um, to progress in, in their careers and, and not do what I was doing as, and, and looking for the exit sign. Um, and so, yeah, so I would love to to see some of the people who are on that. We're on cohort two now. And um, we, you know, through our work with when we've said, you know, it's no good just kind of finding a group of women um, who are you know, near uh, and, and working with them to become profs. We actually need to look further back and look at the pipeline, you know, and look at what we need. We need to do about that. So delighted that this time around there, um, there are different strands. So there's now a strand for PGRs mm -hmm. and there's a strand for early career researchers so that we can actually be working with people along their, their career pathway to, to, um, to, to amplify, to speed things up because the pace has been, has been glacial. Um, so I would love to see that. I would love to see that before before I retire, whatever that's going to be, um, I, you know, there, there, is, there are at least more than one of me. <laughs> um, in, in this position and on a personal level um, my family are from Jamaica and I was out there in January for my birthday and I returned um, having left 32 degrees when I left Montego Bay and I arrived in Manchester and it was minus two and I'm like mm, maybe the future <laughs> lies somewhere else <laughs> I hope you don't mean that Manchester should be 30 degrees. <laughs> well, well, it was last summer. It was 40 degrees at some point. But yeah, so I, yeah, I would definitely like to live more of my life um, in the sunshine. Definitely. I have to say, I, I agree <laughs> with you. <laughs> I also miss sunshine in the middle yeah. of the year. Uh, wonderful. It was uh, absolutely inspirational and fantastic to have this conversation with you. Um, I would like to open the floor to questions, please. So if you have um, any questions, anybody, please uh, join in. Uh, it would be wonderful to hear from you. And uh, yeah, anybody? No? Okay. Lorna. Lorna's yeah, waving, Lorna. I think. Yeah. Um, hi, um, I am in the same department as Don, as I'm sure you know, and um, it, it's really great that, that I feel like we're surrounded by a lot of really great people and not just women in our department. 
Um, one of the things that came up in a conversation with a colleague who was leaving last week was about the differences between inequality, if we say we want to reduce health inequalities, for mm. example, as opposed to equity. Mm. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit, knowing about your, your roles. Yeah, that's a really great question, because for a long time we've, to, we've talked about, you know, we've got an Equality Act, haven't we, for 2010, and we talk about equality uh, of opportunities. Um, and very often we're talking about giving people the same access, equal access to, to resources. But if you have, but that, what that doesn't do is to recognise that we're starting from a different position. So, um, I don't know, those of you who, um, who play golf, you know, people have a handicap for a reason. So it means that if I've got a zero handicap, I can play against somebody which, you know, with a huge one because they take that into consideration so that you end up playing a game where actually the person with, uh, you know, who, who is not as, not as skilled um, could, could, could do equally well. And I think it's really important, though, that when we have that kind of conversation, I've used that, that, that example deliberately because very often, when we start to talk about leveling the playing field, um, the charge is made that actually what we're doing is that we are enabling less able, less qualified, less skilled people to come into posts for which they're not really qualified. And, and I think that is one of the things that we as people on here can really do is to, is to kind of debunk that. But to say, you know, it's a bit like, you know, if you had, um, I don't know, I've got a really good friend whose son um, went to Manchester um, High School, Manchester Grammar School, um, and he went to prep school beforehand. And so, you know, and he occasionally used to come to me, um, you know, to, to when his mum worked away. And I would look at his homework and you could see how the work he was doing at that stage was preparing him, not just for his 11 plus, but to see the world differently and to think differently going forward. Now, when he sits his exam at, at if he went when he sat his 11 plus at Manchester Grammar School, if he was sitting his exam alongside an equally bright 11 year old from an inner city, comprehensive, not with a lovely, warm family like my, like my, my um, young man was, but some young person was equally bright, but, I did, but didn't, had never seen the exam paper before, had no idea how to answer these questions about you know, verbal reasoning and all these kind of things. Then one of them is going to fail, not because he's not as bright, but because he, he doesn't know how to play the game. He doesn't know what, what it looks like. He doesn't, he's not equipped to, to, to do as well. And I think that's where equity it, that's why we need to move to really talking about equity, which is really to say, to look at people's different circumstances. And I'm pleased that at our university, for example, we're doing that when we're looking at contextual data, when we're offering students places, um, you know, onto, some, onto our programmes. And we're taking some of that background into consideration. We're not doing it quite so well yet in terms of research and academic career. So I, I had the privilege of working with somebody as a research assistant, absolutely brilliant, who applied for a fellowship and wasn't even shortlisted and we couldn't quite believe that this person wasn't short absolutely brilliant and the feedback um, they got was that they hadn't they hadn't got a first in their undergraduate degree now the fact that they had gone to the first in family gone to school in quite a deprived neighborhood they'd gone to university at all they got a two one they went on to get a distinction in their masters and they had two paid jobs as researchers and yet people were not able to look beyond where they started do you see what i mean so that's that's yeah whereas it should have been the other way around but if at that point there were two people who had similar great similar marks and had to award it to one and the other you would think well actually looking at where this person's come from you know if, if this is about who's going to make the best of this fellowship actually just looking at the evidence you suggest it's this person who's had you know the, the, the poorest start but has done so much with the opportunities that they've been given sorry Lorna that was a very very long answer no it, it, it was really brilliant and I, I really liked the examples and it made me think of myself and how I've ended up in academia and growing up in Scotland there are three universities in Glasgow and I knew when I went to visit Glasgow University which is our equivalent of the Russell Group that I didn't feel I belonged in it from my own working class background and mm. went to the Polytechnic 
I had yeah. a great time but that's so it's really interesting to think about it from from my perspective as a, yeah, as yeah. a and, we, and we're still doing that you know we, we, there was a reason why we deliberately put Sir Arthur Lewis's photograph on the outside of, of the building because um, young people walk along that corridor from Ardwick and alongside getting off the bus um, to Trinity High School but very few of them would ever think of applying to come here so that's not gone away they will go to MMU They'd apply to Sulphur, they'd even apply to UCLan, but they wouldn't apply here. Interesting, right? Such a simple uh, intervention and uh, could be yeah. So again, you know, you talk about what things that are doing. So people like Natalie Garden, I don't know if Natalie's on here, who and the work that they, they do with, with local schools to raise aspirations. And I have the privilege to go going on a um, residential weekend. Can you imagine me in a bunk bed? <laughs> <laughs> in the Lake District, <laughs> um, but talking to young people about, you know, the year tens about career choices and transferable skills and various things, and it was, just, and I mean, they were so so appreciative and just wonderful. I've never been in a room of year ten people and what's that, fifteen or so who were so quiet and so well behaved and so receptive. Um, so yeah, again, just thinking about that, paying it forward, and if you're not school governor or you know, involved in some kind of program, I would just say, you know, you know, just think about that for your local schools, um, irrespective of your background, but especially those people who come from backgrounds of the, of the schools, you know, the, the children around, and you can go in and you can say, you know, um, you know, they say, well, what do you do, Miss? And you say, I work at the university, and what do you do there? And and just having those conversations where children in Longside, Levensium, Ardwick, or wherever you, you know you live, um, would never even dream of going to university still. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Anybody? No? Okay. Well, let's um, uh, finish here. Uh, it was absolutely wonderful to have you here and hear your stories, uh, truly inspirational. And uh, I hope we'll uh, keep on having these conversations and uh, um, fighting against uh, inequality and uh, embracing equity. Equity. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, um, great. Thank Thanks you. Everyone for Can I just uh, say next week, we are going to have a series of weekly seminars now. Next week, we are going to have a seminar on the uh, sustainable fashion and embracing equity in fashion and true fashion. Uh, the week after will be on uh, domestic uh, abuse. And at the beginning of uh, April, we'll have a seminar on autism and uh, um, neurodiversity in girls and women. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Thanks, everyone. It was wonderful to have you here and um, happy International Women's Day. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks. Bye.